So, so nice to see so many of you here. Uh, I want to, well, first let me say, my name is Adam Hallwell. I'm a research associate at the Samuel Du Bois Cook Center on Social Equity. And the lead instructor this year for the Global Inequality Research Course, for which our theme has been uh, James Baldwin and Global Inequality, which is also the theme for tonight's event. Um, I want to start by thanking the students in the Global Inequality Research Course who completed their research posters and then very graciously agreed to have them displayed at this event. There are about there are 52 students in the course, and a handful of students said they would even be willing to come to the evening event and talk with the general public about their posters, which is an extra level of commitment. So um, to the students who did the posters in our 30 minutes of waiting, thank you. Uh, we're really glad you're here. We're really, really glad to have you join us. Um, I dropped my notes. The second thing I need to say is that um, we the Global Inequality Research is a course that the Cook Center teaches every semester, and the theme changes semester by semester. So the theme for fall 2022 um, was the pandemic divide, COVID and inequality. The theme for spring, of course, was James Baldwin and Global Inequality. And when we put together our capstone event every year, we look for students and projects that could give a presentation in the evening to give an example of what students have been working on, what the course has been like. And ideally, if we can, we try to find a way to have just a little bit of a tie-in to what's coming next. So I'm very happy to tell you that the theme for fall 2023 will be digital bias and machine learning. We've already set the theme of digital bias and machine learning, and it just so happens that we are very fortunate that our speaker for tonight, Michelle Long, will be talking about James Baldwin and AI. So we really have a, the, everything has just really come together tonight for a really coherent uh, program. We've got this semester's theme, we've got next semester's theme, it really all came together quite wonderfully. So I am very delighted at this point to introduce the two students who are enrolled in Global Inequality Research this spring, who are going to give us a talk based on their research this semester. That talk, of course, is called Racial Bias in AI. First, let me tell you about Colin Birkenstock. Colin is a senior at Duke majoring in computer science and political science. Um, as you know, the dreaded question of what you'll be doing next year is always a difficult one. Um, Colin, unfortunately, has a positive answer to that, so you can ask Colin that as much as you'd like after, in, the, in the reception afterward. Colin will be working in the consumer division at Palantir next year with his computer science degree. And we also have with us Kira Varley. Kira is a Program 2 major at Duke, also a senior. Program 2, uh, for those of you who don't know, is when you design your own major. And Kira's major is Social Determinants of Health and Inequality. Now, as it happens, when we were trying to get the Inequality Studies minor passed in the curriculum at Duke, one of the things we said is that students are asking for curricular initiatives on inequality because all the, not all the, many of the Program 2 students are designing majors with inequality in the title. And of course, Kira it was, Kira's was one of those majors that we referred to saying, see, students are asking for more work on inequality in the curriculum. Kira also has a minor in chemistry with her Program 2. And, um, Kira is not sure what she's doing after graduation, so you have to be very quiet when you ask that question at the reception. But for now, we are really, really fortunate to have two people join us, Colin and Kira, to present their research from Global Inequality Research. Welcome. Sorry, I will do a better job talking into the microphone. So our presentation is on racial bias in AI, and we're gonna walk you through three different case studies. We really arrived at this because, as Dr. Hollowell introduced, I'm more of a social science scholar, and I was really interested in bias in AI and the social implications in that, and Colin has a little more of a technical background in computer science and coding. So then we ended up through our discourse at, at this presentation which Colin will now introduce a little bit about AI. Cool. Um, I'm kind of loud and obnoxious, so I don't think I need the mic, but I know you can't hear it, so we know. Um, so we figured we'd start with like a general definition of AI because it's very, very broad. So 
we kind of just gave up and said it's any computer algorithm that performs functions here to for limited to human intelligence. Um, we took that because it's essentially anything that a computer is really good at that using multiple computers. Um, but I did want to take some time to talk about uh, machine learning, which is a special version that we talk about. Um, a lot of people who don't necessarily understand the intricacies of machine learning kind of attribute like Oracle level stats to you know, like ChatGPT, like I'm scrolling all of these crazy pictures, just some descriptions. Like it seems like it can almost do anything. And like Kira was saying, we think that this really helps to kind of understand what it is so we can understand what it actually can do and what it can't. Um, so just a super basic example, this is called a perceptron up there, uh, right here. And this is kind of the basis of the AI game. It was uh, conceptualized in the 1960s. And so a super simple example, let's say I'm deciding whether I want to go to the park or not. Um, X1 could be, is my best friend available to come with me? X2 could be, is it sunny outside? And X3 could be, do I have time? And I'm trying to decide whether I should go or not. So one way we can do this is we can say that this needs to be equal 5, whatever we add them up to. And if it's sunny and my friend is available, then I'm in. Even if I don't have time, it's too good to miss. Um, and if I have time and it's sunny and I go by myself, that's also worth it. But if I have time and my friend wants to go, but it's not sunny, no one really wants to be a part of the rain, right? So we can see that um, the coefficients we use need to equal 5, and it needs to it needs to essentially be something. Um, so the question is, that's just an algorithm. What does the machine learning part do? And so what it does is it takes the, the equation here and it finds the absolute value of difference in what it should be versus what it said, right? So how AI works is it, or how machine learning works is it essentially creates random coefficients for each variable at first, like how much should I weigh each coefficient, and it can start with very random variables, and then it slowly will walk itself back. Um, so for example, if I put like 800 on X2, which stands for it's sunny outside, that means if it's sunny, I'm going to go right? And that will be incorrect. Um, and so it would slowly walk back that 800, hopefully until we get to 3x. Uh, so that's good too. So that's just a quick example. Um, today, you know, Google obviously gets much more complicated than that, where you can have essentially thousands and thousands of perceptrons, um, all in like this gigantic deep learning machine learning model, um, where they can even do things like instead of inputs like, is it sunny or is my friend going? Uh, all of these input inputs could even be like millions of just single pixels for a picture to define if it's a dog or a cat, for example. So it can get very, very complicated in terms of this. But that's just a general idea of uh, how machine learning works. So all that being said, AI and machine learning is being used widely spread across a bunch of different industries. And so we're going to present you with three different case studies of where AI is being used. And we believe that these are good representations of different mechanisms of bias in AI and different social implications of this bias. And we hope to get to the question of exactly when and where can you have AI tools that can become more equitable? And when is it kind of not really possible and the different implications of those studies? So the first case study we have is in the healthcare industry. And there are several different diagnostic tools for dermatology. Um, and essentially all of these models are trained using a database of diagnostic um, dermatological images. So someone went through, collected a whole bunch of images of skin lesions, diagnosed them, like made sure that the diagnosis was correct. And this goes into a database that then the AI models learn from. The problem is that this database does not have diverse uh, skin tones, and it, it's really only accurate for lighter skin tones. And so asking it to then diagnose skin lesions on darker skin really just doesn't work. It's kind of like if you took Colin's model and asked it what I should have for lunch, it does not have the tools to do that properly. So it's no surprise that we see differential outcomes and efficacies in these models across different skin tones. And so this source and this um, study up on the screen looked at two state-of-the-art dermatological AI models that were in practice and they were thought to be really accurate and widely available. And they found statistically significant differences in how these models were able to diagnose skin lesions. So on the next slide, you'll see what the researchers actually did in response to this. So the study also then created a diverse dermatological image bank. 
and they essentially added a whole bunch of new pictures and diagnoses with darker skin tones. And then they retrained the same exact AI model with this new bank of pictures. And what they found was that it both increased accuracy for everyone, just overall the model was better across the board. We also see a relative closing of the racial disparities. So its accuracy on light skin and on dark skin becomes closer equated to each other. So this case study shows how data bias then turns into model bias. If it's not fed a representative and proper data set to learn from, it will never be able to produce equitable results. But at the same time, it also shows that with this particular example, there is room for improvement and you can, you can improve it and you can make it more equitable. So I wanted to take a look at an example where uh, we personally believe that even if you put a lot of resources into creating or into improving the AI algorithms or just the algorithmic um, sort of solutions, that there may not be a, a, a much better solution. Maybe. So for this case, I think we're talking about criminal justice um, and particularly the correctional offender management profiling for alternative sanctions, which is pulls off the tongue. It's called Compass for short. Um, but it essentially uses 137 data markers, um, which they all claim, you know, don't, or mask identity factors as if that were super possible with 137. But um, what they uh, advertise the company as well, the point that makes this, is that there's accurate, uh, the accuracy is similar across both black and white offenders, in that um, I believe for white offenders it's 67% accurate, and for black offenders it's 63% accurate in determining um, their recidivism risk, right? So whether they're going to re-offend if they're offered for more. Um, what ProPublica found um, an investigative journal uh, was that the while the accuracy was similar, the way that it, uh, the way that it aired between white and black offenders was very different. Um, so for white offenders, uh, offenders, it was twice as likely to give a false negative, saying that they were not going to re-offend when they actually did. But for black offenders, it was the uh, offenders, it was the actual opposite, and it was twice as likely to say that they were um, twice as likely to offend. Um, so here's one example, um, one of the examples that came from Pro, uh, ProPublica. Uh, here we see Vernon Prater and Bertia Gordon. Uh, Vernon Prater, uh, when he was being put through the system, had already committed two counts of armed robbery. He was 41 years old, and he was on for a, uh, another attempt at armed robbery. Richard Borden, on the other hand, um, was running late to pick her glasses for up from school, and she and her friend just saw a bicycle and a scooter on the sidewalk, and so they just took them to try to get to the school faster. Um, they belonged to a six-year-old, and the mother came out saying, those are my kids, and her and her friend immediately dropped them and just continued walking. But by the point that happened, a neighbor had already seen it and called the police. Um, and so she was in the system as well. Um, and you can see Vernon was given a low risk score of 3, and Bridget was given a high risk score of 8. Um, but when looking at the actual results, Vernon offended again with, of course, grand theft. Um, but Bridget has no other subsequent offenses. <laughs> and so, kind of what are the learnings for um, the criminal justice system? It's just that one, there's inaccurate proxy data, right? Like, think about how you would actually teach an AI who's going to reoffend. The only data we have is arrest data. And arrest data is obviously the only proximal for um, actual offenses. So if we think of communities that are um, historically over-policed, we have a sampling bias where it's just showing um, that perhaps like black offenders are more likely to um, re-offend. Um, another one is lack of learning opportunities. So if I'm a judge and I'm looking um, to whether or not I should um, give someone a role, and it says they're high risk, and I listen to the algorithm, and I don't grant them parole. How do I know if that was the correct decision? Right? They have no way to possibly prove the AI wrong. And a big part of the AI isn't just the beginning stages of training the coefficients, it's you are continuously iterating in the real world to make it better and better. Right? It's constantly learning. And so this sort of application removes one of the best parts of AI. In fact, it can get much worse where if you use an algorithm to determine um, if you are going to an offender's house to possibly arrest them, and it determines the likelihood that they'll be violent, how do you think that the police officers are going to react knowing that they've been rated as likely to be violent, right? It's much more likely to create a self-fulfilling prophecy, and when they feed that back into the system, it just makes it worse and worse. Um, and then the last one, 
um, which we'll see is different from our last case study, is just it is inadvisable to create manufactured data. Right? So for certain AIs that are skewed, you can create fake data to kind of put it like what you think it should be. However, because with parole, we are trying to map it as closely to reality as possible. Um, it wouldn't be very clever to kind of put in fake data to change the system because we don't know how far to push it in one direction or another. And if we mess up, we could possibly let a violent offender off um, based on fake data. So we'll go to the last case study, which is, oh, sorry. The, the last thing is just, um, in terms of bad data means AI is bad, they did a study that showed that lay people who had two variables, one was their age and one was their previous offenses, were about as accurate as Compass with 137 variables. Um, and in fact, they were occasionally less likely to give false positives or negatives. And so you can actually argue that lay people outperform both judges and Compass. So the third example is resume screens largely used in hiring and employment processes. So this is a very common um, thing to happen. 99% of Fortune 500 companies rely on some sort of talent sifting software. And so it is something that very much does happen. And essentially what, what is usually the form that this takes is you have a bank of resumes that you're trying to screen through. And you have an AI model that essentially wants to know how close that resume is to the resumes of the people currently working those jobs, currently at that company. Those are thought to be the candidates that you want, they'll fit into the company, they're your ideal resume. The problem is that these are largely white men, and so the thing that you have is basically an AI model that wants a resume written by a white male, and any deviation from that is penalized. So it's no surprise that we see racial bias, among a bunch of other biases, in tools such as these. Um, and this sociolinguistic data can take several different forms, and there may be a couple proposed solutions um, by coders or computer scientists that we think you also very much need to consider the social implications of calling these solutions um, before they're enacted. So a couple examples of that could be taking words or phrases that are incorrectly penalized in certain resumes, adding them into resumes that are favored by the models in order to teach the model that that term isn't inherently bad all of the time. The problem enters when you consider that what this will often look like in practice is taking terms that are found predominantly on resumes of black candidates and putting them into resumes of white candidates in order to show that they're acceptable. And so you cannot enact this change and call it a solution if you're not going to then engage in a conversation about what that means in order to use whiteness as a proxy for calling it some sort of anti-discriminatory move and that's just not something that like I'm comfortable doing. Um, and so then another example could be if you were to take resumes that you believe were wrongfully kind of thrown out by the model and should have been considered further, and one that includes admitting that it was wrong, that these people maybe should have gotten the job, so that's one hurdle. Um, and then you would feed them back through the AI model. Um, again, there are some problems in equity in the creation of knowledge, and do you have their consent, and is that ethical to use these people's resumes even though they were filtered out by your model to now train a better model for yourself, and who, who then gets to reap the benefits of that knowledge that's created with their own um, work. And then a third potential solution with problems would be creating entirely false training resumes um, and then putting those into the model to kind of skew your data. And that brings up really important questions of who should be trusted to create these resumes, exactly what the process and standardization of that would look like. Um, and yeah, just uh, there's so many different social implications of anything that you're calling a solution up here that we just think it's a really important conversation to engage in. And it shows just how just how complex this issue really is. So to wrap it up, we think there are generally three tenets to look at when considering whether AIs used in certain fields are somewhere where we should put more resources into, right? Like what would give us the biggest um, bang for the buck? And essentially we think the first one, which was shown by healthcare, is data quality, right? So if we already have the data, and the data is good at pointing to a source of truth, and all we have to do, for example, maybe is parse the data, uh, where we have an AI that's really specialized for what images look like for um, white skin lesions versus black skin lesions, um, then that is a cheap, quick way to increase the accuracy in a statistically significant way. Um, 
The second one is measurability, right? How do we know how well we're doing, um, which is where the criminal justice system comes in. If we don't know if the AI was even right, or if the arrests are good proxies for actual offense, and if it can create self-fulfilling prophecies, um, just imagine, like, take out the oracle of AI and just give it to a statistician. Like, do you think they're very happy with data that they can't use or parse through to make decisions at all, where a lay person can literally do better? Um, and then third is margin for error. Um, can we fake it till we make it, right? And I think the, the way to think about this one is, is the AI making predictions that we want to as closely onto reality as it is, or reality as we think it should be, right? So for criminal justice, we need to get as close as possible to whether or not they actually will reoffend, especially with things like violent offenses. But with things like hiring, if we adjust the bar, and um, at worst we can overcorrect or undercorrect, right, for um, black applicants, at worst if we overcorrect, we end up doing a pretty progressive thing, which is similar to affirmative action in colleges, where at worst, like, someone else doesn't get the job, right, like, which is way different than some of the um, so we think you either have good data or you don't have good data, but you can at least manufacture it in a way that would increase the accuracy of the AI. Um, for sure. Here's our bibliography. We would be open to any questions, if anyone has questions, discussion points. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I would say I personally don't think so, and that was kind of the point of our criminal justice as a, we don't think that that is somewhere where AI maybe has a home. I also think a common thread through all of these is that a lot of times programmers and in the creation of AI models treat biological race as a static variable and ignore all of the social implications around it. And we see that in studies where they will take AI or different models and make it race blind in certain ways. And we find out that actually you can't do that at all. And even if you remove someone's race, there are so many other social factors playing into that that then will still cloud the AI. Um, so I do think that's a really interesting philosophical point to point out exactly where and when. You're right, that is correct. I'm sorry. I meant race as um, marked by the individual is usually how these studies are done, um, reported race by the people in them. Or like one of the thought experiments you can do just to see quickly whether AI could be good or not is like could a really smart statistician or judge do it well? And what we're seeing is judges can't do it well, stats people can't do it well. So like why would we expect AI to do well either? Like we are all operating off the same data, and the data itself is insufficient. So um, I think that it is very very difficult to predict accurately or in a way that's helpful. So this is fascinating. It was a great presentation. Really, really interesting. Um, it got me thinking about this book that came out maybe 10 years ago or so, Weapons of Math Destruction. I don't know if you came across it in, the, uh, in your work. Oh, OK. Well, that have a um, it's really worthwhile. But it's someone who was in the AI industry who thought algorithms were great. They were going to get people what they want and do all these good things. And then ended up finding out that that wasn't the case at all, as you're showing here. But she did different things. One of them was US News and World Report for colleges and the damages that that was done, which I always wanted to see. Right? But anyway, so that, OK, wreck that. Um, a different question would be, like, have you thought about how your research bears on these questions that we're all struggling with, with social media and um, how the algorithms are feeding us <laughs> stuff that is you know, dividing people up and you know, feeding people who consume disinformation, more disinformation, and worse disinformation? Like, how would you apply what you've learned here to trying to change the algorithms that 
that are in place that feed us information based on whatever the complex models are? Yeah, um, we've talked about it a bit in some of my computer science classes. I think this is less of a question about the AI itself and more about what policy means because Unfortunately, like this is actually an instance where AI is like very, very good at giving you exactly what the company needs you to see to keep you engaged and get up that ad revenue. Um, one of the reasons we started this and wanted to create kind of a framework of where it can work and where it can't is, um, like here was explaining, I was complaining that I feel like comps like people, like you were saying, kind of always start out assuming like it's good and we should like shove this forever. Um, and when people would talk about the ads, like half the class would be like, that's really cool, even though they just went over like all of the disadvantages of this. Um, and so I think it, it, in terms of education at least, um, I don't know if I would give any remarks on like what political decisions we should make, but I think it, it probably is more important to give computer science majors maybe a little more in ethics and um, political <laughs> science, um, because then we can avoid things like that. Um, I also see a lot of like, that, like Compass is a great example of also like we can avoid the conversation of race entirely by making it race blind, which is like a 30 year old political decision that computer scientists like recycled. Um, yeah. So I, I was thinking about the, it's like finding You mean like right now? Mm -hmm. um, so the way the way Compass kind of justifies it is they just say like more tools is always useful, um, and so the way it works is like the judge would see the result, like the risk profile of a um, offender, and then make a decision that's supposedly decoupled from that, right? Like they get to make their own decision anyways. Like the, the algorithm doesn't make it in like a this is this is the decision. The problem though is like. Um, there are things like the, the anchoring heuristic, right, where if I give someone a number, even if you know it's entirely fallacious, um, you're still like not going to move as far away from that number as you should. So if, if I give a black offender like a 9, like a very high risk score, even if the judge is like, that's wrong, like they're still going to be anchored higher than they would have been otherwise. Um, and so I think it, it probably just shouldn't be used at all. Colin, so I'm in the unenviable position of saying we have to cut this off. But I do think the number of questions means we've hit on a good topic for us to talk about next semester. <laughs>
Wood gave up Colin Powell, but kept uh, they gave away Cameron Rice, uh, but they they uh, uh, they kept Tiger Woods at that time. <laughs> I, mean, I, I think that's but uh, but the key point is that it is it was a skit that problematizes the concept of race in a deep way that's consistent with a substantial amount of the work that Michelle has done on issues surrounding the phenomenon of colorism and identity. And uh, uh, she, she happens to also, happens is an incorrect term, she also is uh, a major scholar, James Baldwin. And so we thought that it would be fantastic if she would give the keynote remarks this evening. And, and so I uh, would like to invite Michelle to come to the stage and talk to us. sort of creative in a weird, in a weird space. So technically, I'm in um, the English department, former director of African American Studies, and at the Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity. But I'm also an associate director at the Center um, for Human-Centered AI. So I'm around STEM folks, the ones that are creating this AI, the AI systems that you were just meeting with about. So um, the, oh, here. Let me just put this up here real quickly. Make sure this goes up. So I really enjoyed the students' presentations here. Let me get rid of this here really quickly. OK, good. Hopefully this won't make people. So I really wanted to thank also the students. I, I was able to see some of the student presentations before. And I really love them taking on these really big, hot topic issues, because the issues around AI are completely top of mind. What, what the industry calls responsible AI, or trustworthy AI, transparency, intelligibility. The weapons of math destruction at Kathy O'Neill looks like amazing things, and now we have an embedded ethics core um, for CS uh, as well. So anyone who studies CS or engineering is thought that you have to do with these social policy issues, you're so wrong. <laughs> so it's going to be the curriculum. But I wanted first to thank Dr. Adam Hallowell and Professor Sandy Darity. Um, for inviting me to speak at the Samuel Du Bois Cook Center on Social Equity, and to Gwendolyn Wright and Maddie Bratzik for their help in coordinating my visit and taking such care and thought with me. And George, the technician over there, always the most important person in the room, never forget that. <laughs> um, so my title is actually inspired by this drawing that one of my students did in the early Black Lives Matter movement. And she somewhat sacrilegiously adapted this, you know, the common call we've seen on bumper stickers to Christian values, what would Jesus say? And asked instead, what would Jimmy say? Which is not to make Baldwin some kind of divine oracle. He, would, he hated being a representative of anything. Um, but to heed his frequent Jeremiah's for racial reckoning and personal and historical calls to account. And in fact, I think Baldwin actually resurrected would have had a lot to say about AI. It does seem weird to have Baldwin in AI. I totally recognize it. My STEM colleagues are like, I totally don't get it. My colleagues in literature, their pupils dilate when I say AI and Baldwin when they say they do not like it. But I actually think he's relevant here. So I'm really curious, you know, what would it mean to center Baldwin in these debates about the emerging technologies? Because they are impacting all our uh, most intimate private and public lives. So my argument in a nutshell, and I'm going to speak fast both because I'm a New Yorker and because we're a little over time, so I really want to make sure we have time for the Q&A, is that AI does share with earlier socially transformative technologies a reliance, I would argue, on mo limiting models of the human that tend to embed racialized metrics for human achievement, expression, and progress. So many of these fundamental tech mindsets about what codified humanity have become institutionally enshrined. They continue to mushroom. We just saw it in um, design practices 
and research development, so everything that happens before something is actually made, as well as in development applications and platforms, despite the very best effort of some very well-intentioned technology scholars, policy makers, and industry. So there's not, it's not evil people out there. People are trying. My argument here is that AI needs to be much more deeply integrated with the humanities and social sciences in order to contribute to human flourishing, particularly when it comes to social justice. And that's because the social science in the arts, you know, and I'm thinking here as um, Baldwin is a representative, often challenge the commercial imperatives of personalization, which I'll talk about, and frictionlessness, which I will talk about, that are so central to AI applications. You know, you're talking about the ads, they're intentionally sticky and adhesive. Um, and looking at other kinds of epistemologies and world orders other than what uh, historian Joe Lepore uh, calls the new technocracies. If you've never listened to the podcast on Elon Musk, you should, they're very entertaining and informatively. But secondly, I also want to mention, because humanistic and social science inquiries point up the limitations of representing race and ethnicity and gender, all these social identity categories, as normative, self-evident categories and usable, um, monetizable, data points, which is basically, as was alluded to early, how AI systems understand, get traction on um, these identities. In fact, I'm suggesting that approaching race the way AI technologies currently do actually distracts and I would say disincentivizes us from examining racial formation itself. That is, from remembering that race is a function of dynamic social processes and they always index political interests. They are not biological to your point, they're not static. It's not something you carry around in your backpack or a salient in all contexts. In other words, to eliminate or mitigate bias, which you hear a lot of in industry, um, in technologies that are so dependent on very antiquated understandings of race are going to be insufficient for real social change, not least of which, if you've worked in the tech world at all, and I know some in the audience have, um, issues about bias mitigation, which is basically prevention of lethality, so the thing you create doesn't kill somebody, a very low bar, or unintended disparate harm, which is another phrase, it usually gets very tidily tucked under the um, industry umbrella term of safety. It took me a long time to realize why everything was under safety. It's basically so you won't get the lawsuits in case you create something that's going to kill or harm somebody. That's the cynical part of me speaking out here. But what I'm particularly interested in is that a lot of these AI systems have aspect, have impacted us so much. A lot of technologists, my father was an astronautics engineer, and he always used to say, just because you can make it doesn't mean you should. And I think we have sort of subscribed to the idea like, oh, we're just making these things. But science doesn't really have often the answers to the things you're creating. I am interested in the arts in particular because, you know, they are at that intersection of art and technology. Um, and I should say, when I say arts, I mean capaciously, like literature, film, music, sculpture, multimedia, visual, and performance as well. Here's some of the books that you were thinking about before. So I'm indebted to a lot of excellent scholarship already on AI and culture. Um, I won't go through all of them, but if you want a reading list, I'm happy to. There's some excellent work out there. You know, I'm interested in the implications of AI on creative expression. Um, it's pretty urgent given the evolution of these potent foundation models. I mean, some of you have heard of already Palm and BERT and GPT, of course, chat GPT. Um, and they create poems and symphonies, plays, a lot of text to image innovations. This, is, this one was just Dolly, which now seems dated. Dolly came out in like November or something, and now we're way, now Stanford and then probably Duke has these statements you have to put um, because, uh, around the School of Education on, you know, don't plagiarize, don't use chat GPT. I mean, it's, it seems like it's happening very quickly. Um, the, uh, on a good, I see this is partly, there's some good things. So a lot of the AI generated art provoked, and this will bring me to my talk, some of the most foundational aesthetic norms and validation, valuation, like what do we call art? You know, what counts as good art? Is artistry defined by agency or automation? Just who or what can make art? You know, what's good art and who decides? You know, all those questions about um, provenance, 
and authenticity, how do you credential value, creator compensation, copyright, all of those are top of mind. The US Office of Copyright is having these listening sessions because there's no copyright and in April, actually, well actually I guess it's like right around now for, for what to do with um, artists, particularly when you think about the extraction of black creative art and, the re and that the, the, those are all like really live issues right now. This is Christie's, it was created by a gun, a generative adversarial network, so it's augmented by AI, but it completely freaked out the professional art world because there was a lot of gnashing of teeth going on because it sold unexpectedly at Christie's Auction House, which of course is very traditional for 435k. So no one knew what the hell to do with that. I'm particularly interested in the way arts are these incubators of our imagination, and that leads to political engagement is probably why the first thing fascists will do is get rid of the artists and the intellectuals. So on the one hand, we're seen as sort of ornamental. On the other hand, it really is very powerful in terms of uh, suasion. And so one of the things, this is just a very quick example, and I don't want to suggest that arts are just instrumental, but um, some of you may have seen Black Mirror. It's a British dystopian film. This, this particular episode um, won a lot of awards, but one of the things that's interesting about it is Adam Masseri, who was, I think, the CTO of um, Instagram at the time, had seen all these white papers you guys were talking before about the negative effects, social effects of the public likes and, and, and dislikes. And, it's on, and he says in the New York Times, it's until he saw this episode, which basically anticipates a Chinese social credit system, it's sort of near dystopic you know, things that are going to happen with um, possible, with tech, it, that's when he changed his mind, and that's when he changed his policy. So sometimes these enactments and dramatizations have much more potent power um, as well, because the arts do shape our mindsets and our worldviews. Um, and I'm not just talking here about all the science fiction out there, it's usually apocalyptic or utopic. Um, I'm talking about other kinds of presumptions about, our, about how we assume technology and progress are wed hand in hand. For the sake of time, I'm not going to show, I'm going to show you the next clip, but it'll go to a film that I'm not going to show right away, which is Space Odyssey 2001, which is seen as this original tale of, um, of how technology and violence are birthed in the name of progress. Some of you may have seen this. He's, <laughs> the first thing, the bio, basically the point of that, I know it's highly entertaining if you had more time, but it's weird because I'd forgotten this scene, which goes on for a very long time, but basically the bias gets baked into the innovation script. Um, that opening scene is supposedly the first tool of these humanoids who are living in prelapsarian harmony, it's like a bone, is used to murder a fellow humanoid. And then he throws the bone up in the air and it becomes the amazing telescope or whatever the space odyssey thing is. It's a, um, so it really goes from sort of breaking heads to Zuckerberg's, you know, move fast and break things. Um, it goes, it's, it's almost a direct line. I know it's a little, but it also assumes there's always going to be, you know, there's policy implications. There's going to be some have and have nots. You know, it's a very common mantra in American industry, not so much in the UK, to say that regulation impedes innovation, that we just, you know, I, I have it resonating in my head, I dream because I hear it so often, and that somehow violence is, and some losers are necessary for human progress. And so I don't want to belabor, you know, the mishmash of totally misunderstood social Darwinism. But you see it a lot because it also leads into things like this, which is, um, we all know there's a disproportionate of white men um, in relationship to other genders in STEM fields. Um, and that, of course, shapes our view of who is a technologist or who's a scientist or who's a creator in the world. It's usually framed through a masculinist lens. But, you know, these technologists have acquired really outsized reach and elevated cultural influence, especially those deemed or self anointing as geniuses. So we have this fetish, particularly in North America, for geniuses in the tech world, which enshrines this great man like theory, the belief that there are a few exceptionally gifted, providentially tapped men who make history, who make art, who make the world go round. It's a very cherished narrative. They're supposed to be the authors and arbiters of all things. And it's a cherished idealization of a really singular genius as a sort of sui generis iconoclast um, that makes it harder to credit 
uh, the people, often women and people of color in the tech world, because the collaborations, the process, the collective labor that goes into invention, um, it's something Baldwin specifically repudiates in that famous Cambridge Union speech where he says, you know, I built the, you know, I built America, basically. Um, I won't play that for you too as well, although I'd love to have Baldwin in the house. But it means also that we live in the imaginations of a very few people who have the leverage to realize their world and their worldview. So um, one of the things that's important for Baldwin then is to pay attention to these narratives and pay attention to particularly the way um, people of goodwill, just necessarily and particularly for, for Baldwin, um, that is a kind of willed naivete for him, a naivete, a resistance to um, seeing one's um, self in relationship to one's history. And it means also that that boy genius is not innocent, which is a term Baldwin uses a lot to explain this white will towards historical amnesia. Um, and all the questions in AI about what's real or not, because deep fakes are an issue, national security, civic trust, all you know, real issues around AI, they're especially highlighted in the arts because it, they often revolve around a question of also of what's real or not, what's intelligence or not, what is human or not. That's a conversation that goes back, you know, before the Enlightenment because the arts are usually seen historically as an index of like what is human um, and what counts as progress. So what or who we decide is human or not has never been a politically innocent question. It's not in a philosophical vacuum. So when Jefferson infamously opined about the failure of black poesy, he did so on the eve of, and he was talking in general about the lower mental capacities of African Americans and are they fit for civic service and leadership. He did so very publicly to postpone a vote on emancipation. So it behooves us to wonder when and how those conversations come up. Um, I have reflected on like, what would Baldwin say about ChatGPT? Because it's the latest and I swear, by the time I'm done with this talk, there'll be something else because I think GPT-4 is now out. Um, I'm on the review committees for um, Microsoft's uh, and Google's Bing, there's Bard, there's, or I flipped them, it's, a, it's a, uh, Google's Bard. Um, but you know, one of the things I'm interested in is, on the one hand, a lot of people claim that AI is democratizing access to creative expression to those who are traditionally barred from it for either wealth or status. Um, and I'm really interested, and I wonder what Baldwin would say about that these claims to democratization and access function in effect as sometimes as industry cover for rushing a commercial application into the wild, which is just their expression is, you know, put it out in the public and we'll see, you know who dies or who's harmed or what's the negative effect. It, it's sort of what Sam Altman of OpenAI, that particular um, attitude about how are we going to refine through this iterative process. Do we do it um, before we release it? How do we do it afterwards? Um, is AI simply a powerful assistive tool akin to pen, paintbrush, or photography? Is it blitzscaling creativity, as Reid Hoffman of LinkedIn has put it? But you know, despite the centuries worth of opining by philosophers and um, pretty much everybody else that um, all sorts of pundits about the nature of creativity, you know, there is no settled definition about what that is. And so given that, some of the technological claims to expedite this very little understood phenomenon carry, uh, I would say more than a whiff of hubris, frankly. In fact, generative AI may simply automate a highly reductive notion of the creative process and of learning itself. So lots of schools of education around um, the country are trying to figure out that what does that mean in terms of learning. And I'm especially interested in it because the industry mantras are often taken as self-evidently good principles, not just for product design, but for solving the world's problems of poverty, of food scarcity, of inequity, etc. So consider what natural language modeling process applications informing these large foundation models make of African American vernacular um, English, not to mention, say, Toni Morris's signifying on that language system. Um, just try this experiment. I did it with my students who submitted a little bit of Toni Morris into Grammarly, um, which is it's, it's attempted to correct her really exquisite prose. Um, 
and to correct it for what sociolinguists call standard English. And you could quickly see how even these deeply rich meaning can be rendered impotent. So sometimes the question with foundation models, which underwrite the um, AIs you were talking about, they're scaled on enormous, expansive data sets and um, parameters. It's not that their predictive capacities produce form without meaning, which is commonplace. They're obviously not sentient. I hope we don't have to have this conversation. They're totally not sentient. Um, but it's worse, it can often render meaning senseless. So Baldwin writes in, if black English isn't a language, then tell me what is. It, language isn't just communication. It's not a one-to-one -one correspondence to reality. Um, it's a way of making sense of our reality. It's how we name it, how we describe our experience. So the realities and the stakes are, are very, very high. Um, and historically, of course, these creative expressions, as we, I mentioned, poetry, painting, novels, theater, music, it's always been considered a distinguishing feature of humanity um, and a pinnacle of human achievement. So we have to ask, you know, can generative AI not simply do what humans can do or even what it can't do, which is really where the profession is going now. Why don't we, so we don't displace for the future of work um, other, other um, jobs, what would it mean if you created AI that can't do those, uh, that does the thing that we actually can't do? You know, is it ready for human consumption? I would say no, although that, that you know, that it's already out of the gate, as you guys pointed out, it's a Pandora's box. I'm interested in, and this is where Baldwin enters in too, you know, the arts offer completely different, epi different epistemologies. They're different ways of knowing and experiencing the world. And for a lot of people, there are lenses and frameworks that are alternative what can seem to a lot of people, um, really totalizing technological visions, especially when these AI applications are used to solve the world's problems as they're often talked about. Um, so what are some of those? Some of it is just that fiction isn't frictionless, you know, literature doesn't aspire to the seamless user experience, and that is a user ideal, industry ideal of frictionless. And I mean, just think about the slowed down recursive reading and interpretive skills re that you need for anything you read by Baldwin, let alone Morrison. I mean, their work says we have to pause to reflect. It runs up against the grain of our assumption. In other words, literature itself is, is friction. Um, it challenges the notion that creativity um, is simply innovation or product design. We hear that a lot. Um, poetry, well, optimized. I mean, I use this in part just to remember that not everything under the sun can or needs to be optimized. Um, humanities and social sciences value that critical reflective pause, not the push for speed. That's so central to tech development and mindset. As the artist Wilfred Delaney told Baldwin, who's his mentee, he said, look, look again at the world, because what's at one's feet, in their case it was this lowly mud puddle that they were walking by, may just hold beauty and insight. And it's the pause, actually, some have argued, that allows us to see what we're often reduced, uh, seduced into not seeing or unseeing. Um, Ruha Benjamin, who's this wonderful scholar out of Princeton, talks about we're, we're invited not to see, for instance, the invisible labor, the extractionist principles that underwrites a lot of technology. So taking a beat, this plays music, I'm not going to play it for you, but just think about, for those of you who play, you know, listen to jazz or plays, it, you have to slow down, you have to recur, sort of honor this recursive act of seeing anew, not simply thinking, you always know what you're looking at, not assuming the way forward. Um, whether you're advancing your art or social good, is always to adhere to this impossible momentum. I don't know, maybe it's a Silicon Valley thing, but like we're all rushing to keep up. There's this sense of breathlessness that we have sort of subscribed to, um, of the linear, the predictive, the always forward, upward, this sort of zero shot solution. So the arts and frankly social science is asked to pause that. If that sounds too abstract for the corporate folks in the room also, I just recently heard uh, Rachel Gillum of Salesforce, she was talking about that just slowing it down makes for a better ethical product so you can spare yourself some lawsuits if you too hastily create something that's going to hurt. So whatever works for you. There's another expression that's often in the sciences called the blessings of scale. Um, this is dearly held as a truth in Silicon Valley that the blessings of scale um, Basically, bigger is always better, or if you translate it into policy, if you want AI for social good, which is a very common phrase too, if you want social change, then you're supposed to create technologies that impact the most people, so the saying goes. And on the face of it, of course, that sounds pretty reasonable, but consider its application when it comes to arts. It would lead people, and I've had people ask me this too, like, 
which would you rather have, like this intimate in the round theater experience with like 150, 200, when you can impact like a stadium full of people, you know, that argument goes, or why would you have a seminar with 20 people if you can reach 200,000 plus pieces using AR or VR? So at least we should ask ourselves, like, what is lost or gained in thinking about scaling all things? Um, personal agency versus personalization. Personalization, you should know, is basically data scraping um, your own personal data. You are the product. It's usually seen as pushing some useful ads to you, but um, you are the product. There's the Greek aphorism, knowing thyself. It's, you know, in arts and sciences, it is not the quantified self. I'm sure some of you have Fitbit or the little ring thing and all of that sort of stuff, but that is also there's all sorts of privacy and other kinds of concerns, but the notion is that somehow knowing yourself does not mean knowing, you know, every, not sleep tracking necessarily, or, you know, your respiration rate, that you are more than the sum of that. Improvisation versus pattern recognition, possibility versus prediction, all these models are, are um, built around the latter two. Um, let's see if I can do this. It, there's something to be said, even though industry will try and reconcile social good with profit motive, there is a profit motive in the end, and that absolutely shapes and motivates um, what we're creating. Um, in the arts, you have these multiple perspectives, of course, um, but one of the things through AI, like a lot of the sciences, is there's what um, uh, Alice Adams calls the view from nowhere. It's, it's a perspective that's cultivated, of course, in STEM fields, that it's objective and neutral. But what that means is it's especially hard to capture human multiplicity, especially when it comes to race and gender and social identities that I want to mention here. Yep, that's omniscient. I'm going to jump over this. This is just the notion for those as an example of what happens when you get so wed to a certain paradigm or a model that's supposed to have full explanatory force for the world. This visualization was created by a colleague of mine in the School of Medicine who wanted to track racial disparities for all the right reasons and he was using AI for it. The problem was that 20% of his data was compromised because he called it ethnic drift, which is if you're trying to collect from medical records or self-reporting about your race or identity, you know, it changes over time, it changes in different contexts, there's different political reasons we know from the census why someone would identify some way or not. But actually, that, the noise, the stuff that flees outside is probably exactly what we should be paying attention to. There was a little reference um, earlier to, this is, gets me to this issue about how problematic AI systems representing race and ethnicity and gender as self-evident categories, these static data points rather than dynamic. These are, I tend to teach with a social scientist a lot, a political scientist actually, and this is still used often. These sort of categories are either, um, this was dermatological, like race is basically a color chart or a drop down uh, model. This is a common issue. These are a lot of data scraping entertainment applications. This is the ethnicity estimate in the gradient app. It's supposed to diagnose different percentages of one's heritage. Obviously a painful exercise for the student who is um, uh, Chinese, of Chinese descent, like 5,000 years, old, whatever. But I would say that the real problem here, and this goes to some of the concerns too, it's not that the app is incorrect. It's not even a data problem. You could have any more accuracy. That will be cured pretty well. It's that these are social problems. They are not going to be fixed by a tech fix. Um, and in some ways, it, it, it restarts to rehearse, and I'll give you another example of the ways in which race ends up being um, these data points that don't let you look at other the most important things. So here's examples. There's a lot of apps that will let you create whatever you want. This is um, generated photos. These people, you can basically just create the kind of person you want. It's like a eugenicist experiment, but you pick, you know, all these different attributes: um, hair, age, air length, etc. Et and some people say, well, the problem is, is I'm mixed, so I don't fit in. That's not the problem. That would just create and elaborate even more forms of categorization. Um, here's another example, too. They did it to do an end run around. My own image has been picked up by uh, Google Images, which is why I'm very careful about privacy. Not So if you've seen images of me, like my father-in-law saw me on the side of 
uh, bus in Boston as the older than average non-English speaking American going back to school or something like that. I've been on the Hispanic Congressional Caucus uh, as a proud Latina leaning in. You know, there's a million ways that you, your image can be reprinted. This, this solves that problem supposedly because they can just create their own. Obviously, you can see the creepiness factor. If you can create this child who's actually created uh, by algorithmic systems and it goes straight to sex trafficking. This is a perfect example of what I'm talking about. This is a very common thing to just create this particular individual. So it does suggest that there's a kind of computer play of ethnic mix and match, which is also a bait and switch because it has the effect of appearing like it's an inclusive act, but it's actually both binding and blinding you to the ways that tech is engaging in these urgent social and political problems. This, for those of you in the social science community, be much more familiar with this approach to race, which is basically racial formation, um, which is underwritten by political interests that has particular ways in which it's useful or not over history and in these social, larger social projects. I won't go through this. This is the famous Baldwin. This is the predictive sentencing thing. I just, and I want to end on the note of a few things that people are trying to do. This basically, this algorithm was actually, as you pointed out, is meant to uh, anticipate criminal recidivism. It was actually borrowed from insurance companies that were anticipating business risk. So it's actually an example of this problem of sec what they call second use. These are commercial products. You can buy them. Even though we don't have any federal or state legislation or regulation in the US. The UK has it to date. Um, but, and also, by the way, the problem isn't the second use because it was, it was racist in its applications in insurance and banking anyway. So this is, a, this is part of the problem in which people feel like we can use it anywhere and everywhere. And you mentioned um, before calling some of the problems of that. Some of you, if you haven't, if you're unfamiliar, this is a fabulous Netflix show called Coded Bias. I would watch it, Kathy McNeil's and others, which is actually looking about the rise and the problems uh, with uh, FRT facial recognition, which is used in surveillance of people. Um, Rashad Newsom is a wonderful decolonial artist who tries to challenge the notion of obedient robots. This is an uppity robot. It is also trained on black vernaculars and an expanded um, embodied um, there's human-computer interaction, which is it's trained on queer vote moves as well. It to sort of interrupt the notion because I'm sure some of you know that the word robot comes from the Slavic, uh, meaning slave. So there's a direct line between dehumanized labor as well. Um, and there's also many who are challenging these corporate notions of difference and bias in those reductive terms of safety, but in terms of um, rethinking what it means to have these normative standards by which we inform assistive technologies, whether they're cochlear implants or AI that's supposed to help in um, medical environments and nursing homes, which all that stuff is about to go to market. And there's a, finally a very big shift, um, which Baldwin would have appreciated, from uh, not thinking anymore simply of communities, of community impact, as consumers who are differentially impacted, but as co-producers of knowledge. What would it mean to actually bring people of different background and experience into the table, not to help refine your product, to per sometimes to you know, um, upend the table altogether. And that sense, access works on lots of different levels. So you know, getting around this notion of tech companies suggesting, and I'm not demonizing all of them in by any way, but that it's sort of noblesse oblige. We're going to bring you these technologies that are going to uplift your community but still reinforce the notion of an ableist, neurotypical society. Um, and I'm going to end just with this, too, because there is also pushback on this common mantra that the problem isn't tech, the problem is the use of tech, that tech is just a neutral tool, it's historyless, you know, but historylessness has its own history. Um, Joy Pulamini uh, points out that history dwells within our integrant in, uh, algorithms, you can't purge them of that kind of bias. That's what, you know, you can put in those guardrails and the things you're trying to do, but um, that has proved ineffective uh, for all the, some of, and more of the reasons that you were mentioning. Um, and as Baldwin put it so forcefully, these histories will prescribe our futures if we don't reckon with them. So we have to reckon with the past that we carry within and within our algorithms if we want to realize technological futures that offer the most hope for us to be humane. So I'll end there. So I think we have a Q&A with Sandy and Adam, so I'll bring up. 
These are just some policy recommendations, but I'm going to, I'll close this up. Good. I know we're probably a bit early, but I'll do it. Okay, I speak fast. Okay. So we are going to have a conversation between the three of us for a few minutes, and then we'll open, up, open it up to all of you gathered here for questions. But I want to start by saying thank you for your remarks. Um, it is, I've never heard Baldwin AI. And never again. In the same place. <laughs> um, Only here. But what a gift to, to encounter something completely fresh and new. Thank you. Um, and Professor Dirty, thank you for joining us. Cool. Welcome. Yes. So, <laughs> as, a part of, uh, as a part of the course, Professor Dirty gave, gave two different lectures, one of which was on um, James Baldwin and William Stack. And, mm -hmm. and that term. Yeah, so. That's a hot one. <laughs> um, so I thought what I, would, what I would do is just ask um, a question following up on your talk. One of the things that you said was that storytelling shapes civic imagination. And it is easy for me to think about the way that Baldwin shapes civic imagination in the United States. It's harder for me to think about the ways Baldwin shapes a global mm -hmm. civic imagination. Mm -hmm. So I thought I'd put the question to both of you. What comes to mind when you think of Baldwin's storytelling as, a, as something that might shape our global civic imagination? Sure, I've been talking to you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing there. Yeah, thank you. Well, we didn't show the, uh, what, what I would say is first storytelling has been picked up to just mean marketing. <laughs> I've used that phrase in a lot of spaces. And I think the thing that's interesting about Baldwin and AI is not simply, because Baldwin, of course, you know, he lived in Turkey, he lived in Paris, he lived in, you know, he traveled around the world. And he gives that famous Cambridge Union speech in the UK. So he's very careful to show it's not just like this is an American race problem that's, you know, portable or whatever. He always situates it historically. The thing with AI, though, is that, that those narratives um, and the way it shapes how we see ourselves and other people are globalized through markets. And, um, and in part because, weirdly enough, um, they're dehistoricized, the, the tech mantra. You know, the Apple, I was listening this morning about, you know, now there's a new Apple store in um, India, which, you know, they make it sound like it's a little worse already. <laughs> but there's this, the rhetorics that surround um, AI and the, um, omit the very things that Baldwin is asking us to think about. Um, so I actually think that's one way in which I wish I could um, bring the Baldwinian insights um, into these other global corners. And I'm sure you're not just asking the question because he was anti-colonialist. He was, you know, talking a lot about decolonial projects. So he understood um, the world in those larger terms too. Now it's more complicated thinking about global issues. Yeah, I, I was thinking of uh, something that's related to your comments about uh, Baldwin's position on uh, colonialism, yeah. which is I think there was a conversation that he had with a group of West Indian students in London. Yeah, the yeah, recorded. With Dick Gregory. Uh, yeah, that's another one. Yeah, there was a but, you know, I, I, I watched it and I said, well, if I was Dick Gregory, I probably wouldn't have said anything that evening because Baldwin was just so brilliant. But, uh, but that was a context in which I think he was explicitly trying to address his sense of how uh, global imperialism had operated. And, um, and the instrumentalization of certain types of technologies to promote colonial projects. Uh, and that, that brings me back to something that you mentioned where you said uh, something to the effect that the technologies in and of themselves have a societal impact regardless of how they're necessarily used. And, uh, and it made me think of Marshall McLuhan's idea that the medium is the message. So uh, 
I actually would like to hear you talk more about that. Yeah. Uh, I actually have some students who took McLuhan's insight, you know, that the, the um, and call and their papers called the model is the message. Okay. But you know, I have I don't know how many of you are in STEM here, but that's kind of not a taken for granted attitude no. that the technologies carry these um, predilections, perspectives. I mean, that's sort of antithetical to a lot of people um, in, in the technology world. Um, and there's so many downstream implications of it because if you're trying to fix, if you think the technology is neutral, but it's just in bad actors, bad hands, then that takes you down one road, right? You know, you can make sure, you know, governments you don't think are democratic or whatever can't get hold of technology, you know. Um, but if you think it's more probable, if you think it's a data set and you just have to be more expensive, that's an easy fix, frankly. It's so, but if you actually think that the very things by which we identify as data, like the way all the stuff about why we care about race at all, why we're not race blind, why we need vocabularies about how to talk about racial inequity, um, if what counts as data gets, ends up reinforcing, as you all pointed out, really like 19th century positive notion, biological notions of race. That race is on the face. That race is just about color. That race is somehow a blood quantum. You know, that is dangerous. And it's not, you know, and if that becomes the data that gets used, um, then I feel like it's, it becomes really problematic. And that's a deeper, more wholesale critique of a technological, socio-technological project that's harder, that's harder to fix. Frankly, because the other thing is, a lot of technologists will say, understandably, I know a lot of my engineering students who went down the road, and they're like, "Why do I have to take? Now I have to solve the world's problems." You know, before I'd be like, "You create something, and it's like, okay, the policymakers, they're going to figure it out. The sociologists, the social scientists, it's that's you know, going to do it." Now I have to take ethics courses. You know, now I have to. I think it's essential. I think we need um, very well-rounded engineers, we need artists who understand the technology, and also don't feel like you have to be, I was talking to some of the students, credentialed before you can speak about the technology. You know, the guy who created Stable Diffusion, which is mid-journey, some of you have heard of that, has this really snarky thing on his website when the artists were complaining because they were basically taking, you know, from the internet, a lot of artists' work that was proprietary. Um, without permission, um, you know, Getty Images is, is, has a lawsuit against them right now, but these are individual artists. And he, and he wrote on his website, well, you don't understand the law and you don't understand the tech. So, you know, and that's problematic because it also makes people feel like, oh my gosh, I need an, a, a degree in AI and I have to be a lawyer to say something. But you know you're using the technology yourself every day. It's impacting you every day. You're being surveilled in the middle of employees, you know. That's what coded bias is about. And so of course we have something to say about it. You know, we should we should feel like we can comment on it, um, even if we don't know deep down the technology. And I say wait, because now I know way too much about the technology. And I'm stupid. <laughs> so but anyway, that's the long response to Whatever your question was, but, it's like, <laughs> but I maybe we can. Yeah, let's take the questions from the room. Okay. I know people have been in here technically at some point. So. <laughs> There's a, um, an organization's name I'm forgetting right now that happened, that came up um, for particularly digital, digital artists during COVID because there was a lot of artists. And, and so what, I'm forgetting the name of the organization, but it's, a, it's a, an attempt to standardize compensation for artists. So it kind of dovetailed with NFTs and all sorts of other things too. So that makes sure that um, artists' work is compensated in some sort of national understand a way. Um, so there are um, groups out there that are are working to actually recognize, particularly in the digital arts. Um, yeah, it's complicated. We, I, I don't need to tell you about how complicated it is around that, but there are efforts to actually, and there's lawsuits right now with Stable Diffusion and others because, um, you know, the, as you know, all um, things like ChatGPT and, and others 
Um, they basically live in the universe. It's everything. It's all social media posts. It's everything up at the internet, including all sorts of images, including every image that was taken of you walking into this room. I'm sure Duke, like so many college campuses, have some um, surveillance um, 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 capturing um, technologies around. Some you've given permission to. Some you've not. All of that gets up into this, into these. Um, you can't even call them data sets anymore. The mall. <laughs> um, and then, you know, and then people's livelihoods are at stake. So I've been talking about that actually with the Black Congressional Caucus, because one of the things we were thinking about, you know, think of Whitney Houston, you know, who has, you know, an amazing voice, but she didn't write her any of her own songs, right? But you can create, recreate her entire voice. So what happened? And then you can, through um, AI, also create a whole new song. So what about her estate? What are about, I mean, it isn't even just about deep fakes. It's also an exploitation of black creativity is a very long history without acknowledgement. You know, a very long history, you know. And so there are differential impacts for artists of color in particular, too. So they're just sorting it out now. I think there's a, uh, you know, we're in an environment where there's the realization of many, many things that were relegated to the sphere of science fiction and speculative fiction. Uh, and I'm thinking about uh, Connie Willis's short novel called Remake, I believe, and, 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 yeah, in which um, uh, actors from different periods in time are placed in the same films. Mm. And uh, so, and, and, and it's done so seamlessly that it, it becomes, well, this, this gets back to, well, I, I, I'm thinking of uh, uh, Natalie Cole and Nat King Cole being which was on the same video, right? Which is the same. People felt really crazy. Well, yeah, 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 that was creepy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, but yes, we can, we can put people in places that they never were mm -hmm. visually. Mm -hmm. And there's a host of issues that arise about whether or not you can fabricate something that a person allegedly did. Uh, and, and so I think for me, this raises the question about how do we create any barriers or boundaries on the uses of these technologies? Um, it's almost as if if we know how to do it, we're going to do it. Oh. And, yeah, yeah. And, and so is there some way to prevent us from doing some of these things? I'm thinking of you know, the creation of the atomic bomb. I'm thinking of cloning, which has got all types of ethical yeah. issues involved, especially when you move to cloning human beings. Um, and also AI, which is really reproducing and extending certain types of skills and talents that human beings possess. So, you know, is this a train that can be stopped? Or, and if it's not stopped, where, do we, where does it lead us? Yeah. Well, you went right to the heart of a lot of the issues. So um, future of work, for one, that's a big top of mind for a lot of people. Yeah. And then the issues around national security, deep fake regulation. Because I think if you tried to put guardrails in, say, say the UK is ahead of us with regulation. They do, they do have some things in place. Um, but even things around the laws of surveillance are so misunderstood. If you see coded bias, it's interesting because you're asking police forces. So in San Francisco, we find we had a moratorium on um, surveillances that was uh, put up in um, in mostly a lot of communities of color because they get overly surveilled. Um, but all over the place, and you know, there's big debates about whether you can have them on college campuses or not. And the problem is, is that even if you did regulation in those cases. Um, things that are that put national security and civic trust at risk, another another um, uh, country could just use it yeah. as well. So yeah. it's very very yeah. hard to regulate. The thing that's freaking out some people right now is that, um, and this actually is connected to Baldwin, is it's untethering you from reality. So you know, um, people. You know, the, the McLuhan insight is important because it's not just that it's reflecting reality, it's shaping how we see ourselves. So, you know, have any of you used Lensa? 
You know, we probably not going to admit it if you do. You can, like, you know, you can create images of yourself. They're almost like avatars and projections of yourself. And so you, I know you've heard about those, the ways it can actually, um, your own self, sense of self and self-regulation get very distorted, particularly young women coming of age. But, you know, all the biases, beauty biases that we can imagine, um, all the colorism biases. Um, and it starts to distort us. So the, it, the film, the, the book that you're talking about, I do think, some of the literatures, even though they get dismissed as speculative by technologists, is actually have some kind of insight into it. So part of it is they're, when they're dehistoricized like that, and you can put, you know, whatever, is we're not thinking it's a film anymore. Mm -hmm. You don't know anymore. Like if you see, I think there were all those deep fakes out there with Biden and basically everybody, Trump, and you know, you you don't. You, they're very, very, very convincing. Mm -hmm. Like very convincing, and you you don't even if you're a critical consumer of that stuff, you, it's really hard to tell. And so figuring out the usual things that you do in the social sciences of like um, uh, doing the research, going deeper, and finding out, vetting you know sources and things like that, it becomes more and more difficult. Especially if you buy the mantra of size, speed, scale, optimization. You're moving so fast you don't even have time. Like you're trying to get it out immediately. I'm sure you feel the rush of it all the time. I even do. I have to take a beat. Sometimes it's like, okay, I, I don't need to keep up on the latest literature on the very last product that just came out two seconds ago. Like chat, GPT. So, yeah, that was that's a no. The train's going. The Pandora box, the black box has been. Well, there's a Pandora's box that's been open, and the black box is still sealed. <laughs> yeah. interdisciplinarity in practice the vocabularies between the humanities social sciences are easier like I have very long relationships with social sciences but you know initially but, but not too many economists I suspect well uh, with the future of work stuff now oh, I know okay. economists okay. Okay. I know now I know yeah but it takes a while because there's different metrics about what's valuable the institutions value different kinds of things I actually want to do a shout out to your book because I think that the book enacts um, some models of interdisciplinarity that break, breach a lot of silos. And, and so some of the silos were not just, you know, arts and humanities and STEM and social sciences and things like that, which are different, um, but also engaging with a activists mm -hmm. and, and supposedly like lay people. And I think that, you know, so much of what well, I started, you know, I just started reading it, but about your book, and I'd love to hear it. you said more. You know, there's so much written about Baldwin. It's like I edited a companion to it, so I mean, you know, I had Baldwin. I can I can talk Baldwin all day, like that's just <laughs> fine. But I also realized that the way you distilled it and they connected up with like, so what do we do? How do we talk about it? in fact without reducing Baldwin to like he's not didactic he's not going to give you like here's a to do which is which drives the activists crazy sometimes <laughs> like tell us what to do what does he mean psychological reckoning with yourself as just therapy I need action and somehow you walk that line and I think that's also a kind of creative and you wrote and you collaborated with another so I'm, tur I'm turning this to you yeah Adam tell me about your journey um. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'll for context, um, last year I published a book called You Mean It or You Don't, James Baldwin's Radical Challenge, and it was co-written with Jamie McGee, who um, was a Duke undergrad, and we started working, we started reading Baldwin together when Jamie was a student, and that was 10 years ago, and last summer we published a book together. Mm -hmm. So it was a really wonderful um, achievement to publish the book, but for me personally the achievement was having a sustained relationship with Jamie over a long period of time that led to something creative and fruitful. Um, I'll say about the book that um, I like talking to students about it because I think a lot of students 
approach their professors as people who might write books, but I approach my students as people who might write books. <laughs> and I think that as a student, you might walk into the room and think, I wonder if I, I could ever write a book with that person. But as a professor, I walk into the room with the same feeling. And it doesn't happen in six months or nine months or in the span of a course, but it, it can happen. And it's, it's really fun. I just that. want to point out how unique that is, because institutions like Duke and mine, and I've taught also at community colleges and other places, like so hierarchical. You know, you are set up. So the fact that a faculty member is working with a student is also a breach of disciplinary usual practice that I think is incredible. Because then you're not like the oracle on high, although you are that too. You know, but like, it's, I call that power sharing. That's an, that's an activist act. That does not come easily or it has to be intentionally. So yeah. shout out to you for that. On the matter of creativity, I would, I would say that <laughs> You were talking about blessings of scale, and, and one of the things that has happened is that um, Baldwin has been blessed with scale <laughs> over the last 10 to 15 years. I mean, people like me are writing books about James Baldwin now, which means he has hit a significant scale. Um, I, when, we, when Jamie and I set out to write the book, one of the main things we had to think about was how do we write about Baldwin without trying to sound like Baldwin? I mean, when you're writing about someone... Oh my god, it's so hard. If you read any of it, I start to sound like him. It's so hard. It's got, like, paragraph-long sentences. I it's, start to... It will, it will always be a terrible imitation. Like, there's no... <laughs> it will shape how you, how you write, but then your writing will be awful compared to his. And so... Um, oh, the imposter syndrome. Right, well, no, sorry. <laughs> that was just a setup to say, what Jamie and I set out to do is to ask, what is it that we need to say? that isn't already in Baldwin. And one of the things that we needed to say was, well, what are some steps that you can take if this has impacted you? What are some things that are happening right now that Baldwin didn't talk about because when Baldwin isn't here? And I think that sometimes when you come up against people who feel like a genius like Baldwin, you can feel like it shuts off your own voice or your own creativity. But for us, what we really found was that we didn't need to feel intimidated by it. We just needed to keep asking, well, what is ours to say? What is, what's, the thing that we, what's the thing that we need to say from who we are? And that doesn't mean that we're trying to imitate Baldwin, but it means we can write alongside. See, I think that's really powerful. I just want to point out something for people who are older than you, like me. Is that thing that's so interesting about Baldwin, you just mentioned there's books out on them now. In 2012, when I had my last sabbatical, I was at, the, New York had the year of, of Baldwin. I can't remember what year, like his death, his birth, his whatever. Um, but the thing that was interesting about that was um, the, uh, Felicity, I can't remember her last name, she was a New York Times reporter who was asking why Baldwin had fallen out in favor with, like, off the bookshelves, like, of my generation, and I grew up at K-12 through through, 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 in New York, you had to read, not like just, you know, Sonny's Blues, but like a lot of Baldwin, like Baldwin was top, like he was a very um, well respected, um, well known. He was in the cover of Time Magazine, a 63 like author, and then he fell out of favor. And there's all, and that I find interesting because people who are canoned come in and out of canons, right? So he didn't fit within the rise of black nationalism because he was queer. So like people in the world point, he didn't fall well into like queer literary and cultural studies because he didn't like categories. It, it looked like he was disidentifying, even though he wasn't. So he, he didn't fit. So actually, before Black Lives Matter, he had fallen out of favor. And then my students started, he started showing up in these little, you know, memes and little clips and things like this. And anyone who's read Baldwin knows it's sort of stunning. He, you know, anyone tried to take like a little short snippet of Baldwin because he has very, very long sentences. But like you can pull up Baldwin and find these little bumper sticker like things. So I think that's an interesting account too, which is he's not, you know, canons aren't, um, you know, a priori givens. They come and then they go. And I find it really fascinating that you found your way, not just to not be intimidated, but to actually, n not just by him, but just by this long history of him coming into favor and falling out and getting, doing something new. I think it's a very unique book and you should all look at it. 
that's enough for that. But we didn't even ask. Uh, do we even have to? More questions from them? What time? Is there wine and food out there? Because I think that they've been very By all means, should we? Well, I'm not in control of this, but Let's if my students thought there was food out there, there would be more here. <laughs> it seems that it's time for dinner, so please join me in thanking, join me in thanking Dr. Alam for her talk. Thank you. Is that the food we served in the room next door? Is that go out into the... Outside the terrace. Okay, great. If you go outside to the terrace, you'll find dinner. <laughs> Terrific.